Hello everyone, welcome to today's episode of Research Notes. Our guest today is an historian, a journalist, as well as academic content creator. Today's guest is Anotila Chikumbu, currently a teaching associate, PhD candidate, and a Frederick Gilbert Bauer Research Fellow in the Department of History at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst in the United States of America. He has a YouTube channel dedicated to educational videos on academic research and writing. The channel consists of oral histories, book review interviews, public lectures, and social science-oriented panel discussions, as well as humanities content. While the primary focus of the program is African studies, the series also covers subjects on international affairs. Anotida, welcome to the show and thank you for agreeing to be interviewed today. How are you? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prim. I'm excited to be on your platform. I was excited to receive an invitation from you. Ah, nice. I'm looking forward to having a good interview. Great. So besides me reading your bio, I always start by asking every person who comes to the show to kindly share with us their field of study and their journey in terms of how you got to where you are today academically. Uh -huh. Wonderful. Um, I think that's that's uh, this is probably the first time that I'm getting to share the uh, you know my experience academically, you know where I've come from and how I've developed the interests that I currently have. Mm -hmm. um, so in summary, I can simply say that uh, I'm I'm interested in three aspects. I'm interested in uh, modern African history. I'm interested in world history. And I'm also interested in what we call historical biography. Yes. So these are what I can call my academic research focus. Um, but I also have journalistic research focus uh, since, you know, since I do both history work and journalism. Yeah. So for journalism, I am particularly interested in the oral histories of contemporary Zimbabwean politics. I usually research and write about elections and presidential leadership. And on elections, I particularly focus on youth participation uh, and factional politics uh, in Zimbabwe. So those are basically my research interests, um, and they are informed also by you know a background of what I've studied in the past, and the interests mm -hmm. that I've developed, you know, growing up, going to university and all that. Um, so I'm just going to briefly talk about the academic research focus and the output that I've done so far um, that I'm currently also and that I'm currently also working on. So I um, I'm doing a dissertation on the Second World War and the decolonization of uh, Africa in general, and I'm particularly just focusing on Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. um i it's a dissertation that looks at how africans from southern rhodesia which is the name that was given to colonial zimbabwe how they were mobilized and recruited uh, and what their wartime experiences were like during the second world war and what the demobilization and reintegration experiences into civilian life after the war were like for them uh, so very little is known about this group of people because the Second World War is just usually presented as a predominantly European war. Um, and very few people know that Africans from Zimbabwe, our grandfathers, participated in uh, the Second World War. Little is known mm -hmm. that our grandfathers were actually right at the war front fighting the troops against uh the against the Hitler against the Axis powers and against the Japanese so that's going to be a very important contribution i've done some presentations and i have articles that will be coming out in journals and in other uh book projects that are being worked on and uh for my journalism work i usually write for two newspapers i write for the daily maverick in south africa and I write for the Newsday in Zimbabwe yes. with a particular focus on the areas that I've just uh, uh, told you about. So that, that is all about the work I do. And I've always been interested in politics and military issues. Um, and that, that explains why I, I, you know, I chose to, to do research of, of that nature. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for that comprehensive explanation. 
I think um, many people like to ask in academia to say, what is your original contribution to knowledge? And you really <laughs> demonstrated this. So yes. I really like that you're doing this. And history is important in terms of adding to narratives that are silenced or under-researched. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for, for doing the work you're doing. And I wish you all the best um, in your examination processes. Thank you. Uh, Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, also, so you mentioned that you do journalism and that your research outputs will also be in journals as well as books, which I think is very important because in academia, you don't just disseminate your information in one way. Mm -hmm. I think on average, one person's dissertation may be read by like under 10 people in their life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you are also reaching out through the work of teaching. And I just mm -hmm. wanted to ask you, in relation to your research and interests, what do you teach and why? Yeah, that's uh, that's an important question um, uh, because I've been teaching like all my life. So I always tell people that I, there's, I've, I've never done any job, any other job, except being a journalist. Um, I've never worked anywhere else outside the academic space. After finishing high school, I became a high school teacher. And from then, I taught like in four different high schools. And after that, I went to teach in the university at the University of Zimbabwe. Um, and then from the University of Zimbabwe, I came again to teach here. So at, at a very young age, I've gotten like loads of experience in teaching. And it's been, it's been quite a very interesting experience for me, very profound experience. So currently, I teach a class called history of Africa since 1500. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a class that um, exposes students to the history of the African continent since the times of uh, the transatlantic slave trade uh, and the times of the ancient empires that we all popularly know of, the ancient empire of Ghana, the Great Zimbabwe state, the Zulu state, and all that. So I, I, it's an overview class that looks at the history of the African continent, pre-colonial social and economic systems, the imposition of colonial rule, uh, the, the consolidation of empire up until the time of the decolonization movements, until maybe the modern trends that are happening today. So it's just an overview class that is meant to expose students who would have never studied anything or learned mm -hmm. anything about the African continent. So it brings together students from business studies, engineering, computer science, uh, because it's a, it's a general education, you know, type of a class. So it's not just for like history majors only. Uh, and what I particularly like about teaching this class is that um, it is it is very very relevant and effective. It is it it gives this um, um, excitement that you are teaching people who know nothing about the continent, yeah. people who have not been exposed to anything and they actually want to know the very basics. Uh, this is different when you are teaching uh, history majors because they already have prior knowledge and prior understanding. Definitely. But those who are focusing on other degree programs, they are just maybe focused on engineering and computer science. So it's a very interesting thing to do because you know you are making a very, very substantive contribution to make somebody who does not know a single thing to actually know something and to uh, with substance that can be compared to those people that do it in a specialized kind of form. So it has been very interesting for me to teach that class uh, here at UMass. It's the class that I've been teaching since 2012. Uh, because before then I was just like a teaching assistant, but now I have the independence to design the class, teach it, um, you know, do everything I want with the class and all that. But uh, at the University of Zimbabwe, I taught um, I taught two classes: one called Economics for Economic Historians, mm -hmm. the other one called the Economy and Society in Eastern Europe. Um, again, these were also courses within a, a, a department, a new department of economic history. Um, and the first course tried to expose uh, what I can say history majors or students of history to some basic economics concepts so that they can be able to blend and understand their position as economic historians. 
And the other one was also important because it it exposed them to the growth and development of economies of the world, especially the economies of Eastern Europe that are not uh, so much studied and focused on uh, by the syllabuses that we're all exposed to since high school until university. So nobody knows about Russia, nobody knows about Czech Republic, mm. Romania, Yugoslavia. So it, it was very important because it gives people a complete picture of what the world is like other than what Africa and Europe is like. Oh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for these contributions. And Wonderful. I commend you for your approaches. So on the one hand, for example, when you're teaching in Zimbabwe, you were teaching economics to economic historians or economic mm -hmm. history majors, which I think is very important because I often struggled studying politics and international relations, knowing how it's relevant to economics, but not having that grasp of yes. key economic yes. concepts. Yes. And you also taking a historical approach to common words these days, coloniality or decolonization. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. you've got these classes where students come from different fields of study, which I think is a dream concept for, for any university. And I don't know why it hasn't been adopted yet, because uh -huh. we often speak to people in different sectors and we hope that they can help to decolonize. But they don't uh -huh. have this history, for example, from the 1500s, which is your uh -huh. current focus. Uh -huh. So really, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that, you know, there are spaces where such changes have already been effected. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mm -hmm, definitely so um i don't know if you like this question but most people doing their phds always get this thrown at them with all this knowledge um are you going to write a book you know what are you going to do with your research yes obviously i um it's something that i'm looking forward to, to doing uh maybe post phd Yes. I plan to compile all my chapters and even the chapters that I've written before for my master's because I've always been doing one and the same research. Okay. Um, like since undergrad up until now, I've always been researching about uh, Second World War and First World War mm. uh, African soldiers. So I, I plan to compile all those chapters into a book. Um, I'm still debating the title uh, of the or what the title of the book should be, but I do plan to compile a book so that for the first time in east in the history of Southern Rhodesia or the history of Zimbabwe, I get to present the history of the Africans that participated in colonial wars, which I like to call the forgotten men because mm. nobody talks about them. Uh, in in Zimbabwe today we have the we have a political problem. Uh, of uh, not recognizing key historical figures in a very fair way, um, you, know, you know, in a very inclusive kind of like fashion. There are Africans who participated in colonial wars, the First World War, uh, the Second World War, and even the Anglo-Boer War is way back as the eight, 1899 to 1902. We also have those that participated in the in the Second Chimreng. So most of these people are not recognized and are not given their fair share of attention in historical discussions and historical discourses. Why? Because they're usually labeled as colonial collaborators. Um, they are just like dismissed because the, the, their history is a reminiscent of colonialism and white minority rule. Definitely. But that is, is a very unfair approach because it deletes them from the historical narrative. And they, mm. it appears as if they were non-existent. So that is why I like to call them the forgotten men, because they did actually make some very important contributions, given that we it was the context of colonial rule. Yeah. Uh, their histories must be understood and must be taken into account, considering that. Mm, true. So the dangerous framing we've been exposed to, whether through African history or European history, and also the, the point on Eurasia, Definitely. When it's out, please give us a shout. We'll be there oh, to yes. buy as well as read, which is the most important part, yes, <laughs> of course. Yes. yes. Um. So given that you've always been in teaching and exposed to your research topic, 
would you say that um, there's something you wish you knew, let's say, about a career in research five to ten years ago that you know now? Um, yeah, so I, um, it's a very, that's, I think it's an important question. Uh, but uh, maybe I'll try to answer it in a very, in, in, you know, in a more comprehensive way so that you understand, you know, the backdrop to it. Yes. Um, I do have things that I wish I knew, um, but at the very same time, I have things that I wish um, enabled me uh, to to give a more a more concentrated focus on something that I like the most uh, at an earlier stage. So I I can easily break it down like this. <clears throat> so when I you know when I finished high school. I was not quite clear as to what I want to do. Mm. I was just interested in politics. I was I was interested in political discourse generally. Yes. Um, but being pol- interested in political discourse was simply not enough for me to decide a clearly defined career path that I would want to take. Yet it was a very critical juncture because I have to apply for a degree and I have to start to study it. Indeed. So if you're interested in politics, does it mean that you should study political science? That was the questions I had. Does it mean that I should study history? Does it mean that I should study law? Does it mean I should study international relations, conflict studies? I have all these options mm. because all of those subjects do explore political discourse in some way or form. So that wasn't clear to me during that time as to what exactly I must I must take as it is now. Uh, and I probably wish that if 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 we had enough career guidance during our high schools, we would get into universities clearly knowing, you know, what is what is what we must study and what is good for us given our abilities at that point. So I got into um, I got into history because I I loved history so much. I was very, very, history was my my best subject in high school. So I applied for, I I got into a history program, but it was economic history. Uh, And I got into it and all I wanted was for the lecturers and the teachers to teach me politics. I want to be taught politics. (laughs) But unfortunately, they, they, most of them didn't like teach like, political stuff because uh, remember it's economic history so most of the courses are to do with economic thought the development of economic thought and all that Mm. so it was not centered particularly on politics Uh, but some courses would come in with some politics and i would be interested and then i finished my undergrad i wanted to be a teacher after finishing my undergrad and uh, fortunately i did get that job uh, but after getting it, I didn't enjoy like you know uh, the remuneration. I was very oh. passionate, but the remuneration was just not good. I felt mm-hmm. like wow, I must probably try out something. So I, I decided to go for a master's in um, in economic history. So it is at that point that I feel like if I had um, if you no, know, if I had been told or if I had been mentored enough to understand um, what I need to now just particularly focus on being an academic and mm-hmm. being a professor because the path of taking up a master's, PhD, you know, mostly takes you to that route. Yeah. So if I had, he had been told then, if I had been mentored enough to understand that I'm going to be an academic mm-hmm. and, and nothing else uh, probably, <laughs> I should have maybe started then to build my... Uh, my CV along the lines of just being an academic uh, and choosing uh, research interests that are very particular and just start focusing on them, knowing that my my career path is now like unilateral. Uh, But I didn't. I still felt like I had options. I could still be a journalist. I could still get into politics. I could still study law. Things were just not clear. Mm. Uh, but fortunately, after finishing off my master's, I applied for PhD programs. Uh, and fortunately, I got the one the one here. Yeah. Uh, but I started out by going to London 
where I stayed briefly for a few months. I thought I was going to study there, but it didn't it didn't work out well. But now I feel like I understand very well where I'm going and how best my intelligence and knowledge can be contributed to society. Um, maybe if I knew earlier that, you know, I'm meant to be a teacher, you know, to produce knowledge in different mm -hmm. forms, I could have probably started uh, way earlier. But I always felt like I have options of switching and changing because the environment in, in, in our country doesn't offer you that luxury to just explore something without looking into like economic considerations, the possibility of getting a job. So that messes up everything. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for, for those reflections. Um, and though, though our paths are different, I think on a personal level, I was good at writing. I liked mm -hmm. English and history and I was getting good grades there. Mm -hmm. And whenever I told adults I liked writing, they were like, just do journalism, you know? <laughs> but I don't think there's a direct correlation at all between oh, yes. liking writing and journalism. And then being a journalist, yeah, yeah. Yes. And then mm -hmm. when I realized that I was very much interested in the work of the United Nations towards the mm -hmm. end of high school, that's when mm. I was like, okay, I can channel my writing and research towards, towards that field called, called international wow. relations. But even mm. then, there was no guidance. They were just like, how good is your English mark? If it's good enough, you definitely get admitted into the humanities. Mm. I think it's still very popular nowadays, particularly in South Africa, where I studied. Mm. So I also stumbled upon so many things in my journey, like... The fact that you need to be able to conduct research in a thorough mm -hmm. way and in different research methods and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I only realized in my fourth year, which was the honors year. So mm -hmm. really, I really wish we could be more prepared at an earlier Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. So definitely. young people watching this, you know, will get a few insights, even though this is not direct yeah. um, career guidance. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, awesome. So um, as part of this show, I also ask my guests if there's anything they want to ask me. It could be one or two questions. Um, so I'm never ready because I don't know the questions you prepared for me. But do feel free to ask me any questions if you've got any. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, um, you know, that's a good thing. Um, I, I always ask people questions, you know, in yes. my other job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's that's a pretty much a good thing to do. So, what was your, you know, your your the focus of your research, like your PhD research? So, the focus of my PhD thesis was on looking at the Southern African Development Community, that's SADAC, mm -hmm. and what we call their peacemaking approaches to election crises. And um, I only picked two cases, which were Lesotho and Zimbabwe, because they are the two countries, I think, in the region that have had um, electoral crisis being, you know, looked at by the SADC mm -hmm. in wow. terms of mediation, conflict resolution, and um, sort of like creating, in Zimbabwe, there was um, a global partnership agreement. Lesotho mm -hmm. at some point also had what they call an interim um agreement so that different mm -hmm. political leaders could share power so mm -hmm. it was ignited by something that happened when i was younger when i was 16 in form 4 in zimbabwe 2008 you know we had an electoral mm -hmm. crisis we were being sent mm -hmm. home but i never knew what was happening mm -hmm. obviously during my studies no one ever touched on that um mm -hmm. studying in south africa and there was no focus on sadak whatsoever which was very weird except mm -hmm. for maybe one lecturer who taught us about Thabo Mbeki's um, quiet diplomacy. Mm -hmm. So really my interest was on why were these negotiations um, taken by the SADC through the lens mm -hmm. of elite peacemaking. So it was mainly, you know, the major people who are fighting for power that mm -hmm. had to sit at tables, that had to discuss which political seats they were going to take in order for the nation to, you know, have a semblance of order and governance. Right. Uh, um, so really, I looked at it. The answers, I think, in politics are usually quite obvious when it comes to Lesotho and Zimbabwe. 
These are what I call militarized democracies, but you often don't hear people labeling them as such. Um, yeah. in mainstream media, you know, or at a SADC platform. So I did manage to engage with quite a few stakeholders that were part of those processes um, and to hear from them on, on why things went the way they went um, and why, for example, there were no fresh elections, you know, if the whole election is just not working, you know, mm -hmm. why not try something else? And mm -hmm. also to look at how um, the two countries' issues also show why SADC is now hesitant to have a strong um, tribunal. So they mm -hmm. suspended a tribunal. It hasn't come back yet. And their intention mm -hmm. is that when the tribunal comes back, it will only look at, at um, inter-state crisis, of which in SADC, it's intrastate crisis that we often mm -hmm. have to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, eventually I just highlighted uh, a few points around the inefficacy of SADC. Um, mm -hmm. back then and I think it sheds a lot of light on why they perform dismally anyway even mm -hmm. now so mm -hmm. That's true. That's that true. was yeah. um, the main focus of my study I don't know if I've answered all the questions you had oh yes yes uh, that, that was the that was the most important one and you know that's a very I think that's a very important contribution um, mm -hmm. you know Sada plays a very important role that needs to be studied and you know, it's a central role that needs to be explored to whether how effective is it as a regional body. Um, because I'm sure, you know, countries pay subscriptions to sustain the operations of SADAC. Mm. So if it, if it's not, if we don't study, you know, the effectiveness of his work, uh, it, it you know, it's a waste of taxpayers' money, taxpayers' mm -hmm. attention. Yeah, so that it, it's a very necessary like, investigation. Definitely. Thank you so much for that. In line with the conversation we've had and overall based on the work that you do, you know, Elsa is an academic content creator. Do you have any last words for our reviewers and listeners? Wonderful. Last words, I'll take this opportunity to to uh, say something about the work I do. So I, mm -hmm. you know, I always interview people, um, especially about their books about their latest publications um i've 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 noticed this trend uh that um academics don't usually get the attention they need to get or that they are supposed to get mm. because of the limitations as to um, the the popularization and the spreading of the knowledge of latest publications and the work that they do. Mm. Uh, in most cases, the stuff that are written that is written by academics, it's just like read by uh, reviewers and peers who are in the space. Mm. And in the end, a book or an article, as you said previously, can just be read by 10 people in a lifetime. Mm. Yet it's a very important contribution to knowledge that a lot more people are supposed to know. So as a way to try and bridge that gap between uh, the general average people, uh, the business world, the civil society, the average man, and the academics, I decided to create a platform uh, that can be able to you know, explore and uh, popularize the academic work that's being done by, you know, academic people who are researching and teaching in institutions so that the world gets to know and understand firsthand the kind of research that is coming out of academic institutions. So tomorrow I have an episode with uh, a professor here at the University of Massachusetts Amherst mm -hmm. who are going to be talking about his latest book. It's called Super States. Um, and I would very much like your audience and you yourself to to join and watch uh, the program. It's a very interesting program that has attracted the attention of you know thousands of people across the globe who are working on academic research and writing. Oh, well, thank you so much for that. And I'll make sure I put up a link to your channel yes, below yes, this yes, video. Yes. Um, or at the end when I put down credits, it's it is very important. And I definitely also urge um others to to look at at that content. I'm not sure if I first found out about you on LinkedIn and then mm -hmm. YouTube, 
it was mm -hmm. then LinkedIn. But <laughs> you know that your content, you know, is getting out there. Uh, yes. And it's definitely very important. Please continue doing um, that important work. Mm -hmm. And that's all from me for now. Thank you so much for joining us today on Research Notes podcast series. I'm Dr. Primrose ZJ Bima. I'm on a mission to demystify the world of research by engaging in conversations with a diverse set of intellectuals, academics, industry professionals, as well as creatives. It's goodbye for now.